PR Pro Cannabis Media. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Weed Talk News. I'm Jimmy Young, the founder of Pro Cannabis Media. And I'm Kurt Dalton, the founder of Cannabis.net. Every week, Kurt and I get together to talk about the cannabis news stories of the week and add some insight and commentary. Plus, we get reports from all over North America. This week, it's all about polling and the upcoming election. And of course, we encourage everyone to exercise their right and vote. Right, Kurt? Absolutely, Jimmy. And remember, we're not voting on the sixth this year. It's the third. But let's bring up the latest polls from Bloomberg about where cannabis legalization stands in each state. I know what's amazing about that, Kurt, is if you look at this graphic, Arizona, 56 percent in favor. That one may still go either way. Mississippi is the closest at 52 percent, although Montana which I thought was going to be a slam dunk, is under 50%, 49%. And then the one that I thought was in trouble would be South Dakota, which has both medical and rec on it. And there, they look like that's going to pass no matter what. Surprising results for you? Uh, well, as we learned from four years ago, polling can be way off come election day. Arizona's been trying for, I think, two election cycles, let alone uh, maybe longer, at least certainly on the rec side. Medical just got through. Um, so let's see, you know, let's see how next week shapes up and what the last minute, the money on the spending, but overall in general, it's trending very much in a pro cannabis direction for this particular election. And I believe that money spending on the pro cannabis side is outspending the other side, uh, four to one. So uh, again, money talks in American politics, right? And people want to get elected. And if uh, so many people want something, you should probably endorse that so that they elect you and reelect you. So it kind of makes sense, not only the money, but also those positions to be in power by voter choice. Do what the voters want and people want it. That sounds like a democracy to me. That, that's a good thing. OK, there's also some concern that the majority party in the Senate might be in trouble. Now, if that's the case, expect to see some movement on one of the three different bills that have already received House support. That would be the Moore Act, the Safe Banking Act, and the States Act. And each one of those bills, Kurt, has a different, um, just a different thing for the cannabis community to celebrate. One opens up the banks, one expunges records, and the other one allows the states to have interstate commerce and totally legalize. And I believe that's the States Act. So uh, either way, all three of those is going to be a win. But in this current situation, all bets are off, right? We don't know what's going to happen on Tuesday, do we? No, not at all. And as we mentioned in previous shows, it's a lot more interesting to see if the uh, Democrats can get the Senate. Because as Ed Markey spoke earlier uh, uh, a few weeks ago, they have enough votes to override any presidential veto, Trump or Biden. So really, you want to watch the Senate, the Democrats. They could take the Moore Act or the States Act, combine it. I really want full decriminalization. Uh, that's the biggest thing we need to happen. Um, and uh, full legalization as well. Uh, but again, they'll put something together. They'll kind of wash it all together, open the banks, create interstate commerce, and legalize it, at least on the medical side, where people around the country, regardless of your state, could have a medical card for a treatment, say, of epilepsy, Alzheimer's, anything like that. That's the, the, the humane thing to do, let alone the right thing. And of course, our friends on Wall Street, you can watch that market going up and down and you will see a lot of movement over the next few weeks, no matter the result on Tuesday. But the most important thing, go out and vote if you haven't already. In the meantime, our report from Wall Street with Deborah Borchart from the Green Market Report. Deborah. Thanks, guys, and happy Halloween, everyone. Well, this week was a scary one for the Dow. It fell over 2,000 points on fears of another COVID lockdown taking over as hospitalizations have begun to rise. Tilt Holdings announced preliminary financial results for the third quarter and some management changes. The company promoted Gary Santo to president and appointed Brad Hock as its permanent chief financial officer. Third quarter revenue is expected to come in between 40 and $41 million. That's a 4 to 6% increase from the second quarter revenue of $38.6 million. California-based cannabis company 
Hollister Biosciences gave an update on their third quarter sales figures. The company said it generated record quarterly revenue of $12.5 million, and that's in Canadian dollars. It apparently seemed like a good week to issue more shares. Aurora Cannabis filed a new prospectus with securities regulators to make an offering of up to $500 million of common shares. That is a lot of dilution. Akerna priced a public offering of 5 million shares of its common stock at a public offering price of $2.40 a share. And that's the big news this week. I'm Deborah Borchart with the Green Market Report for Weed Talk News. Here in our home state of Massachusetts, where four years ago voters approved adult use of cannabis, Thursday was the day of Burns and Levinson's annual State of the Cannabis Industry event. Yes, it was all virtual this year, and it was headlined by attorney Frank Siegel's one-on-one -on -one interview with Stephen Hoffman, the chair of the Cannabis Commission in the Bay State. Our own David Rabinovitz took in the webinar, and David, I expect there was some discussion about the now controversial delivery licenses that were supposed to be distributed this week, but some in our legislature decided a longer public comment period was warranted, so that's been delayed. How did that go? Well, Jimmy, first let me make a comment. I really don't know if it was completely some in the legislature. This was, from what I understand, the Massachusetts Dispensary Association, which I believe is the 25 largest vertically integrated operators who made the push. They reached out, they got a bunch of legislators that were more favorable to their cause to write letters. I understand that they, um, uh, somebody I should say, sent many of the municipalities a recommendation that the municipalities respond. And at least one of the municipalities forgot to take out the part of the letter that said, insert here and sent their letter in. So that's what tipped everybody off that there was somebody behind it. Um, huh. the, the, so this is really a battle between the large fully integrated operators and the smaller social equity players. And it did take up quite a bit of the keynote address. Um, the fireside chat that Frank had with Steve Hoffman, the chair of the commission. Um, and Steve Hoffman was sticking to his free market principles. It doesn't look to me like there is a lot of vacillation on the commission. They seem to be committed to the social equity program. They're going to hear people out at this new listening session, November 13th, and then they take a vote on November 30th. And um, I I'm not as concerned or nervous as I was that this whole thing was going to be tipped on his he its head today as I was a few days ago. Okay, that's good. Kurt, what's your read on this? Yeah, I was going to ask David, if they go through and change some sort of uh, uh, model that greatly favors the entrenched dispensaries with a lot of money, doesn't just doesn't this stink to high heaven of a backdoor deal? Doesn't this look like a check's been cut? How does the Massachusetts Cannabis Control Commission avoid this dilemma? And maybe they, they, won't, they will avoid it, but it sure looks really stinky if things get changed to really favor the rich guys. I agree. And I think the only way that's going to happen is if people very high up in Massachusetts government get involved. And what I mean by that is I'm not talking about the legislature. I'm talking about the attorney general, the governor. Remember, there are four commissioners seated right now because one is left. Right. These, and they the, voted 3-1 the, for these delivery licenses uh, not too long ago, right? That, that's correct. And one of the commissioners is leaving after this current regulatory review. Um, and another commissioner who sits in the social equity seat, their term was up, but they're now a holdover. And it's a matter whether they're gonna be reappointed or not. So I would suggest that if high up in Massachusetts politics, people don't like what's going on, then what they'll do is they'll just move some of the commissioners around, right? Because this is like appointing judges to the Supreme Court. You pick the people who are gonna have the outcomes that you want, and they're gonna be able to replace, they could replace two to three people. So, However, yeah. the difference is the Supreme Court is a lifetime appointment. And I believe commissioners, is it four years? I, I'm not sure. I think it varies according to which seat you hold. All right. But, well, David, we uh, look forward to uh, hanging out with you on the Green Rush on Friday on the Pro Cannabis Media Network's Twitch.tv channel. And I will be seeing you then. It's, I'm very looking forward to that, Jimmy. That's going to be a great show. Always is. All right. Since Maine used to be part of Massachusetts, Let's get to our main man, Rye Russell from WeedBudsRadio.com for this week's Maine Cannabis Report. 
your main man here, Rye Russell from Weed Buds Radio, with your main cannabis report for We Talk News. Let's kick off our week with some positive news for the cannabis industry up here in the Pine Tree State. The trustees of Efficiency Maine finally reversed a ban that was put into effect to keep state legal cannabis businesses from receiving energy efficiency grants. The reason behind the ban was allegedly due to the uncertainty of cannabis regulation. The group claims this ban was due to the fact that it can take many years before their grants provide a return, and because of uncertainty on whether or not the federal system would revoke the state's rights to issue licenses. However, as most expected, the federal system has seemed to allow legal operations to continue without issue. And therefore, it is not efficiency Maine's position to enforce policy, but rather make a decision based off of the perspective of energy and energy alone. We are still seeing an embarrassing rollout of the adult use cannabis market in Maine's largest city of Portland. The city continues to battle with their program and had originally placed a cap of 20 adult use stores for their initial phases of the program. Opposition to this cap would like to see cannabis handled and treated like the craft brewing industry that Maine and Portland are so very proud of. The fight has finally been taken to the ballot for the residents of the city to vote and decide whether to either keep the ban in place or to remove it entirely. If the city votes to remove this ban and all of the eligible applicants are approved, it would position Portland to have more cannabis stores per capita than the city of Denver. We move on. We are now under one week until the election, and with many cannabis-related issues on the agenda, we will eagerly await next week's results, both here in some of Maine's largest cities and, of course, some interesting things ahead for the entire industry across the nation. I'm Rye Russell from Weed Buds Radio, and this is your Maine Cannabis Report for Weed Talk News. Just when you thought all those ballot questions are favoring the cannabis advocacy movement, sure enough, there's a mayor in Mississippi who is challenging the actual question just days before the election. Madison, Mississippi Mayor Mary Hawkins Butler filed a legal challenge to that question that made it onto the ballot. She's claiming that the signatures came from four districts, not the five that was used back in 2009. However, there are only four districts around in Mississippi in 2020. So the precedent is a little bit, uh, let's just say, bunk, Kurt? (laughs) They might not allow, you know, science books in their schools, but they're going to go back and figure out which districts and how to find a loophole to try to block block cannabis legalization. So uh, the ironic part is Mississippi is probably one of the two poorest states in the country in that the black market, if legalization and or decriminalization get through, will be enormous down there because of the extra money generated by a closet grow, a grow in the woods, a grow somewhere else. Uh, it will be a hotbed of illegal cannabis activity if they don't want to make it legal. And what's ironic about Mississippi is the University of Mississippi is the only federally backed university that is allowed to research and grow cannabis and they're using seeds from the 70s kurt well that kind of falls in line with uh if you don't want to know the answer don't ask the question and they're just using really bad product and getting improper results so there you go they don't have to really test anything another reason why they need to open it up and let the research begin now there might be some trouble on the international front for cannabis advocates the world health organization is recommending descheduling cannabis internationally. However, when they presented to the UN this month in Austria, it seems the United States had some issues with those recommendations. And in short, the US actually disagreed with four of the six World Health um, World Health Organization's recommendations, largely because these changes would, quote, introduced legal ambiguities and contradictions that would undermine effective drug control. And at worst, they could result in the exclusion of control of all THC derived from cannabis cultivated for industrial purposes and THC derived from leaves separated from the cannabis plant. This would undoubtedly lead to further cannabis abuse, unquote. The UN, the United Nations, is now tasked with coming up with a way to regulate the international cannabis market 
and trade. Kurt, how is this going to help open the international market that seems to be already kind of thriving and operating with Canada exporting their product to Europe and Uruguay exporting their products? How are we ever going to control the international market of cannabis at some point? You kind of knew how this movie was going to play out. This is the usual stance of the U.S. at the U.N. on any type of CBD or THC uh, change. They're always putting their foot down and saying, no, no, no. The good news coming out of this vote, though, was that all of Europe got behind the 0.3 uh, THC percent, and they all want it unified for the entire continent. And I'm sure Asia and Africa will fall into line. So removing the usual response from the U.S., the entire world agreed that 0.3 is going to be legal and shippable and everything else for CBD usage. So that's actually really positive. They want to unify it and make sure they all are kind of playing by the same rules. And again, I think uh, after this election, regardless of the president, uh, uh, certainly if Biden does win and Democrats take control, you're going to see that all change anyway. Well, I guess it's all about change. And when it comes to change, who better to go to than our friends in Washington, D.C. at the Vote Pro podcast, our reporter, Phil Adams with the Washington, D.C. report. Phil? I'm Phil Adams from Vote Pro podcast, and this is the Weed Talk News, D.C. report. With less than a week to go before Election Day, proponents of pro-cannabis state ballot initiatives have outraised opponents this election cycle by nearly 36 to 1, according to Marijuana Business Daily. This represents a marked increase over four years ago when pro-cannabis advocates had outraised opponents by just 4 to 1. Legalization measures are currently on the ballot in five states, including Arizona, Mississippi, Montana, New Jersey, and two in South Dakota. Most recent polls show either a plurality or outright majority of voters in each of these states supporting legalization. The Food and Drug Administration's Office of Women's Health will host a virtual event next month on the use of CBD by women. The multidisciplinary scientific conference will discuss the potential sex and gender differences in the use and effects of CBD and other cannabinoids. Researchers, educators, clinicians, and patients are invited to attend this virtual public event on November 19th. Information is available at federalregister.gov. The U.S. Postal Service and the Drug Enforcement Administration have officially unveiled a new Drug-Free USA stamp. The new Forever stamp was created in partnership with Miss America 2020 to help raise awareness about the dangers of drug abuse. In a press release on Tuesday, DEA Acting Administrator Timothy Shea called the new stamp a, quote, powerful image and message to promote the battle against drug abuse. That's the Weed Talk News DC report for this week. I'm Phil Adams from Vote Pro Podcast. Trick or treat time in Mexico. It looks like the Senate of Mexico will vote on the legalization of cannabis in their country before the end of this month, which is Halloween on Saturday. Now, if the Senate in Mexico passes the legal cannabis bill, it will still have to go before the other house of that nation's Congress, the Chamber of Deputies, kind of the opposite of what goes on here in the United States, where the House did it first, and then it goes on to the Senate and didn't go anywhere. What do you think about Mexican legalization, Kurt? Is that inevitable? Absolutely. And if you read Cannabis.net this week, we have a story up. The um, cannabis advocates have planted a cannabis field right next to the Senate building, and they can't take it down, and it's been there, and it's like a 1,000 plants, and people take care of it and water it, and it's literally right outside the windows of the Senate um, trying to get them to legalize. And just based on the export... Uh, the history of Mexico, the cost of labor, the cost of electricity, the access to water, it's going to be a big exporter. Right? Whether you like it or not, it already is on the illegal side. And then in 10 years, it's going to be one of the world leaders as far as export and grow because the costs are going to be so low. And that's what it's about in business. And finally, just in case you might be thinking about leaving the country, if the election does not go in your direction, whichever that is, you might want to think about the Bahamas. Sure enough, a committee there has been charged with figuring out how to create an economic recovery plan by legalizing adult use, medical use, and religious use of cannabis, Kurt. 
This is something our good friend Omari Jackson's been on with Jamaica, and they're certainly based on you know historical reputation of the plant have a head start on everyone. But a great idea if you're looking for economic recovery and you have kind of the history Jamaica has. I'll use in this example. What a bit what better way than than you know all inclusive weed vacations, historical context, trying different flavors, herb. Um, definitely, I what tourist wouldn't if it's legal and you're not worried about coming back to the U.S. and being tested. Certainly gives a new hope to the resort of Atlantis down there in the Bahamas. One day we'll all get down there and celebrate again together when COVID disappears in a year or so. Anyway. Oh, yeah. Who doesn't want to do edibles and go through that shark tank and see the sharks right after you doing the water slides? Come on. That's on the list. <laughs> it's on the list. Well, anyway, that'll do it for this week's Weed Talk News. I'm Jimmy Young from Pro Cannabis Media. And I'm Kirk Dalton with Cannabis.net. Remember, it's a whole new world of weed out there. Use it responsibly. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. We Talk Now, We Talk News, and In the Weeds are all available on most major podcast distributors like iTunes, Spotify, Google Play, and our friends at clnsmedia.com and our flagship, cannabis.net. So subscribe, share, and like our videos on all the social media networks out there, including LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, The Weed Tube, and YouTube. Weed Talk and In the Weeds are two productions of Pro Cannabis Media supported by Revolutionary Clinics, one of the top medical cannabis dispensaries in the Massachusetts area. Now with three locations in Greater Boston, two in Cambridge and one on Broadway in Somerville. Rev Clinics has a patient first mission. They will customize your needs as a medical patient with the proper titration and combination of strains, flavors, and products. Rev Clinics, where the patient comes first. We are Pro Cannabis Media.